Welcome everyone. This is the sixth uh, workshop in our Embrace the Open series. I am Paola Corti, the Open Education Community Manager of uh, Spark Europe, working with uh, the European Network of Open Education Librarians to support uh, the implementation of the UNESCO year recommendation as far as we can. This is the sixth uh, workshop in our series, and the topic today is reusing and creating OER. And our facilitator today is, is uh, Susanna Stojiska. And Susanna is, uh, works as an Open Science Support and Citizen Science Ambassador at the Slovak Center of Scientific and Technical Information in Bratislava, Slovakia. Thank you very much. I hope I will manage. This is my first international workshop. So I hope you all will help me and be active participants talk to me and uh, add your experience because my experience is limited, but I hope we'll manage it together. So today we will talk uh, about um, the content of previous workshop number five, and then we go to today's topic of reusing and adapting and creating OERs. So we will talk about diversity of open educational resources forms, uh, about benefits of reusing open educational resources, about creating with students' needs in mind, sharing content in reusable manner, and selecting appropriate licenses because it's the legal framework of uh, sharing open educational resources. And, uh, we still need to raise awareness on this topic because um, at least in my country, we often see um, faculties or uh, different organizations who want to share openly their content, but uh, don't add any licensing information or are not aware of open licenses. So what was in the workshop number five, uh, we discovered uh, what type of open educational resources we can find online. We identified relevant repositories and resources. We looked at applying effective search strategies, explored existing finding aids and search tools, and discussed where to go to get help from the community. So now we know how to find open educational resources. And the second logical step is to use them. So in this workshop, you will uh, learn to identify open educational resources for reuse according to the topic, format, license, and the context you are working in, because uh, this all has to fit. Uh, then you will learn to select open educational resources uh, to best fit your students' learning needs, to modify and adapt reused open educational resources as allowed by the open license and acknowledge the authors properly because every author needs to get credit and every source has uh, to be mentioned. Uh, also, we will learn how to increase the accessibility and reusability of OERs we are creating and choose the right licenses for OERs according to the uh, requirement of project we may be working in or our institution if it has uh, some policy and the context of our work. So uh, the first warm up question is who you are and who you are in relationships to open educational resources. So are you a discoverer, user, creator, adapter, curator, or any other role you can think of and you think is your favorite in relationship to open educational resources? So please uh, share your role in the answer, answer garden poll. I'm users and reusers, and I think uh, many librarians and also uh, academic uh, faculties have a different role in, re in relationship to open educational resources. Most of us are creators, we love to create, and uh, we can look into the literature. Uh, 
uh, Olgang Admiral, researcher, uh, analyzed data set from Open University, and uh, he found five types of users of open educational resources. Most of the people adapt and reuse. Uh, they, in the survey, answered that there were less experienced educators which learn from these resources and also use them. The more experienced uh, were uh, active commenters, which is also important role in relationship to open educational resources, because uh, only with with comments and the resources uh, can uh, grow, and um, other people will see uh, which ones are the best for them. Uh, there are also uh, more experienced educators who also add resources, maybe librarians or curators, and uh, some lower percentage, but very important part where experienced educators who interact with all phases of their use process, who adapt, create, publish, add, and also comment open educational resources. And we hope we all someday get there. Uh, me, myself, um, feel uh, in the beginning of, of this cycle amongst less experienced educators, but I hope I will get someday between the experienced ones. And also there is some uh, about 10% of low level OER users, maybe also in the beginning of their journey who are mostly retain and uh, consume the resources to learn. So we can see using, adapting, and commenting on educational resources is an important way to move the educated community forward and pass on experiences. So we want to uh, become conscious open educational resources users. Uh, according uh, to uh, another article, many of the users of open resources uh, may not be aware of uh, the legal framework. They are not aware they are using open educational resources. Uh, they maybe think that what is accessible, accessible is also free to use and uh, may not distinguish between open resources and other maybe copyrighted resources, uh, which creates possibility of unintentional copyright infringement. So we need to raise the awareness. Um, my experience from Slovakia is that many faculties and non-governmental organizations also uh, are willing to share, but are not aware of uh, Creative Commons or other open licenses. And when I talk to them, uh, they are surprised <laughs> what, what is it and that they can use it, that uh, it's not necessary to register anywhere. Uh, they just can put the license and uh, allow others to use their resources freely. So it is important not only to use the resources, adapt and create, but also talk about it in your community. And when you see free resources without um, any licensing information, uh, you can talk to the authors and uh, maybe raise their awareness. So to the main point of uh, today's workshop, context and diversity of open educational resources, there is many of them. They are as uh, colorful and diverse, various as uh, the needs of uh, learners and students and their educators. Uh, now we can see them in the context of open science because open educational resources are there alone. Uh, they started in a similar way as uh, a movement to open access to publicly funded research outputs. So researchers wanted uh, their results to be shared openly without paywalls. And in a similar time, also educators uh, started the movement of open educational resources and uh, all these aspects of open science, like open methods and data, which are necessary to help others do what we do 
and to help to repeat experiments, do reproducible science. Also, open source software can help us in this aim. Open source software is also important for open educational resources uh, because many of them depend on open software and it would be senseless if we would like to share openly our content and don't have the infrastructure or share our open content with the use of closed infrastructures or um, paid software. So. Uh, there are many other aspects uh, which influence each other and strengthen each other and work together like open peer review. Uh, part of open educational resources are not peer reviewed, but uh, many of them more complex forms as open textbook need peer review as any other scientific output. And open peer review helps uh, to manage it transparently and every user of the source can see uh, the whole process of its uh, creation and reviewing. A responsible research evaluation is needed because we need to create motivations of educators and scientists to share their results. If um, they don't get any uh, credit or any points in evaluation, uh, they are motivated only by the uh, idealism, but we, we need uh, some more forms of motivations to get the work done. Citizen science is my favorite part and it's also connected to open education. Uh, it may be considered uh, in, in a school context as a, a, one of the highest uh, forms of open education because it's learning by doing and by, by helping the science. So citizen science uh, in school is very successful and helps to raise uh, scientific literacy and also enhance science itself and uh, the relationship of uh, the public uh, and their trust to scientific methods. And also citizen science needs open educational resources uh, to teach its participants uh, the correct methods. Every of this aspect uh, also interacts with civil society and strengthens civil society, empowers citizens to solve uh, their problems with help of science and uh, evidence-based processes. So open education has important part in open science and also depends on the ecosystem of open science and also has uh, important influence on civil society. So once more, what are these open educational resources? In the previous workshops, uh, you already maybe know, but just uh, to be sure, open educational resources are here to overcome barriers in education. One of the barriers is barrier of access. So open educational resources are learning materials free for readers or users to access and to use. And also uh, we overcome legal barriers with uh, public licenses, which uh, give us the clear definition and uh, clear conditions to use these resources. Open educational resources, as uh, we can see, are aimed for teaching and learning and have uh, many various formats uh, and media for various target groups and educational needs. It can be images, infographics, videos, presentations, uh, but also uh, materials connected to educational process like methodologies, instructions, lesson plans, uh, experiments, on different media, so it can be sound like podcasts or it can be images or some uh, practical instructions and also the scientific content like scientific articles, which can be uh, in some way used in education 
and uh, frequently used textbooks and uh, also complex forms like courses and modules. So often educational resources have many forms and um, except the form there are also other sources of variability as languages, text complexity, use of terminology. Uh, we have to choose uh, the level of terminology according to the student and, and their age and their experiences. So the format of open educational resources is influenced by age of students uh, because open educational resources uh, may be aimed for uh, children as well as uh, for the people in lifelong learning in any age. So we have to know knowledge background of our students, uh, their perceptive abilities, and also we have to set our learning objectives, what we want to teach our target group. Uh, we also need to know the subject, the topic, uh, time frame for learning, how long will our lesson take to choose the right form and method, number of the students, because some forms are suitable for uh, only small groups, other forms are better for bigger groups, uh, expected learning circumstances and many other factors. And because of uh, this variabil uh, variability of forms, it is important to cooperate with representatives of target groups. And if we can co-create our educational resources to see their feedback and um, to make it work. Bloom taxonomy, maybe you know it, maybe not. Uh, it's quite old taxonomy but a revised it's framework for categorizing educational goals which helps us to choose the right open educational resource and also uh, it can accompany us on our open educational journey we as uh, the students beginners start with uh, the awareness and remembering the facts Open educational resources can help with this, with uh, different uh, form of uh, mnemotechnic uh, tests or exercises. Uh, the second step is to understand, not only to know the facts, but to know the connections and motivations, uh, to be able to clarify or explain to another student and the third step is our ability to apply, to use the information in a new situation, uh, implement it as a solution or demonstrate. Uh, the fourth step is to analyze, uh, differentiate, organize, relate, compare. Uh, and other step is to evaluate, justify, stand make a decision on the base of your knowledge and the highest step is to create produce a new original work and i hope we can do it after or, or in the course of today's workshop with open educational resources uh, the most simple unit of open educational resource I could imagine was image. So we can start with an image as an example of reuse. The first step is to find it. Uh, on the previous workshop, uh, we could see some favorite repositories where to look for them. And then we have to check if our image has open license, which permits reuse. We have to attribute it and then use it in our lesson textbook or elsewhere. Uh, as an example, you can see this Kingfisher. We attribute it with title. What is it? Kingfisher author who made the photo, Boris Smokrovich, and uh, source where 
can it be find uh, in this link and a license um, in the world of open educational resources the most used most frequently used licenses are creative commons but there are also other types of licenses for example this unsplash license but uh, it is very similar because you can reuse uh, images for free with a condition of attribution telling who the author is and where to find it. Uh, you can search for open educational resources on uh, CC portal uh, according to the license. If you know, uh, if you want to have CC by source image, you need to, for example, illustrate your textbook with image all you can choose here on the CC search portal and you will get here. You can check which licenses and you can choose from a different material. Uh, this portal finds for you. So let's uh, look at the process, how to make open educational resources meet students need in the beginning. We have to ask our needs, consider our aims as a teacher and what does our student need. We have to set some criteria about topic, form and um, other important factors and then search with this criteria in mind. When we find our open educational resource fitting to our criteria uh, in open repositories with open licenses, we can evaluate and choose uh, the best fitting one, or if you couldn't find any, maybe uh, the only way would be to create the material we need, or perhaps uh, to search among copyrighted material and ask authors for permission. It is also possible to include uh, copyrighted material in the uh, open educational resources, but uh, it creates uh, some complications in, in the attribution and also how you can license it then. But maybe sometimes it's worth a try because some authors uh, can be willing when they see your aim of uh, making open textbook or other nice open educational resource. Maybe they agree you can use their material for free or with uh, their conditions if they are reasonable. But our ideal course is to choose from the free material and then to test material with our students, get their feedback. And if the feedback is positive, if everything works, we can share the results of our work openly. And this uh, will be put in more detail in the next workshop. And if uh, we need some minor revisions, we can uh, go one step back and adapt material also when it, it's good, but not exactly fit our needs. We can adapt and then get to test and uh, make these rounds as many times as is needed to get uh, the best material. Sometimes it can happen that uh, our assumptions in the beginning were not right. And when we need to correct false assumptions, we will go back to the beginning, set uh, new criteria and, um, and then go find another fitting open educational resources according to the new criteria. So now it's time for a little activity. You can search in your favorite repository for open educational resource to reuse or adapt. Or maybe remember from the previous workshop, uh, you can try one of these open educational resources, Commons or Merlot, Oasis, or uh, BC Campus Open Collection or ORC. You can choose open educational resource according to your priorities and determine which educational objectives you would like to achieve with this results uh, you can have in mind um, knowledge gaps or perhaps uh, you are teaching some course and 
uh, there is a point where students struggle, uh, maybe some problems which have to be put in other, another way or explained differently. Maybe some good scheme could help or another resource. So here, here we can uh, take some time and think about our educational objectives, what we want, and try to find some open educational resources to help us. But you can take your time later. That's why I added all the links to all the repositories that are listed in these slides into the chat, and you will find them also in the presentation uh, as soon as we share it, so that you can take your time to explore them at your own ease and according to your goals. And hopefully, uh, my suggestion would be uh, it's easier for me to find uh, the proper OER when I have a, a specific purpose in mind, meaning uh, a target group of participants or a specific topic that I'm interested in sharing, then it's uh, somehow easier for me also to find uh, uh, the proper resources to reuse. I don't know, that's my experience. What about yours, Susanna? Yes, I, I have uh, always uh, more aims to solve. So, uh, for example, at this time, I I have in mind uh, open educational resource on publishing ethics um, because we will have a workshop on this topic and I think it would be nice uh, to help the participants of the workshop with some scheme on publishing ethics because uh, there are a lot of articles on, I don't know, predatory publishing and different aspects, but uh, I don't see if uh, there are somewhere um, put uh, together in relationship. So I would search for such thing and if I wouldn't find it, maybe I will create such such a picture. So when we find a resource and uh, want to know if it's the right one, we can ask many questions and the first is about content, if it covers what uh, our students need to learn, and if the knowledge is current, accurate, and appropriate for, for the age or context of the learners. The second question may be on accessibility. Uh, is the resource comprehensible? Uh, can students understand this level of terminology? Is there any other factor that prevents students from accessing the content, for example, technical aspects? Uh, will uh, the students in a time of learning uh, have laptops or tablets or not? Uh, sometimes it's very convenient to work digital, like in this workshop, but perhaps in other circumstances uh, can be very effective form of learning just to have uh, the students, their minds, and some um, pencils and papers because uh, they would have uh, to focus more. Well, back to the questions about the use. Can, can we use the resource? Is the license open enough to ever allow us what we want to do with the OER? For example, some licenses uh, allow using, but don't allow modifying. We will see in the next slides. And also we ask questions about quality. Was it peer reviewed? Uh, we have to be also a bit of peer reviewers by ourselves. And um, to consider um, our criteria we we have chosen in the beginning of our search. Also format is important. Does the material come in an accessible format? For example, I can see one picture. It's very nice. I would like to use it, but uh, it's just a JPEG format. So 
I would have to recreate it uh, to achieve some changes or modifications. Also, um, some sources are in uh, proprietary software formats, which also can be a problem for the users. Other criteria can be clarity and the description of uh, the source itself, so the metadata, also a level of organization of the content, uh, modularity, it, uh, uh, if there are a big chunk of texts or is it uh, in uh, some a neat pieces which are easier to understand or divide or used only one part that we need and not uh, the whole complex resource. Also, we have to consider if uh, the source or resource or author is trustworthy. We can see if it has recommendations, some ratings, statistics, if it is uh, downloaded many times or not, if it's rated or peer reviewed, what what is uh, in uh, in the open uh, peer review statements, if they are accessible. So how easily modifiable is the resource, if it's interactive or not. So there are many different questions we can ask, but the final arbiter is our personal assessment, if it's suitable for our goals or not. There are uh, many rubrics for evaluating open educational resources uh, we can use. Some of them are scoring. Uh, and then we can uh, compare the resources according to this score. Uh, but I personally like more the qualitative review. So look at it, see if I like it and consider the different perspectives. How would like uh, this resource my students or um, but it's it's on the consideration of every teacher and reuser of open educational resources. And then we come to another question of Answer Garden. What aspects of open educational resource evaluation gives you the most trouble? Are those technical aspects or licenses or assessing content or quality? So let's think about the evaluation. What is the most problematic part for you? We have a question from the audience. Ivana, yes. and hi Ivana, uh, nice to see you in the audience. We have a question uh, that states, uh, just a general question, how students are sensible to the license aspects of the electronic resources? That's a very interesting and compelling question. Thank you, Ivana. In my experience, um, our students are not very sensible. <laughs> but we have to we have to teach them um many times they just ignore the aspect they think if it's free it's okay to use and also are not aware of creative common licenses and it's one of the first things we have to teach them and talk about it uh, that it's important do you have different experience Good morning. Good morning, uh, Ivana. Good afternoon. Um, no, no, I had the same experience. <clears throat> I had the same sensation because I'm not a teacher, but uh, I'm a librarian in my previous life. Mm, I had the same um, sensation because uh, for for students, but not only for students, if uh, resources if is on the internet, is free. <laughs> is uh, free to use and uh, it's automatic it's difficult to 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 learn to teach is uh, for 
is a boomer <laughs> question. I, I can say when I talk also with my children, it's the same. Uh, I have the same answer <laughs> to my question. Are you sure that this resource is, uh, you can use this resource? It's not. Uh, May I add to that? I agree that it's, a, it's, yeah. a, it's important to learn them because uh, it's important uh, to use, but you, you have to know who are uh, the, the authors. Uh, uh, and so, so to, to educate is important. Yes. May, I, may I add a comment to that? Yes. Uh, starting also from uh, my own experience and uh, with students of all ages, I would love to under underline this because uh, it's really important that it's not only like this, um, let's say it might be considered like this superficial approach from young people, which is not because it's not the attitude only of young people, right? That if I understand correctly your comment, Ivana. Um, and it, I completely agree with that, and uh, it is also consistent with my experience. And uh, I think that uh, it's, I agree, we needed to continue offering opportunities to know that dealing with open uh, resources in general and educational resources, if they are openly shared, means knowing more about the licenses and also uh, it's a, a good way to address this as um, something to be um, seen as an advantage for uh, participants uh, to courses, whichever their age is. And uh, not because, uh, not only, I would say, because they would be more compliant to the law, because this is something that is mandatory somehow, but it's, sometimes it's not motivating enough to know more about uh, licenses because everyone feels free to reuse, as you said, Ivana, anything they find on the internet as if it was open, not only as if it was free. And um, so uh, working with them in order to underline what are, which are the advantages for them to share their resources openly and what does it mean to add a license from their own perspective, then they can get closer to the advantages and understand better how to be respectful of other people's and other authors and other creators' uh, needs. So that's what worked in my experience, not to address it as something like, you need to be compliant with this law, which is true, but is not motivating enough sometimes. No. <laughs> Motivating only the yeah. low. It's very important to know the sense of um, making things are, are compliant to some rule. I think it would be better for the students to encounter uh, Creative Commons licenses uh, before they come to university, maybe in high school or uh, in elementary school when they first begin to work on projects. And uh, the attribution uh, should be the basic part of the project and not only attribution in relation to copyright but also open licenses i agree susanna because in a way if you start early it becomes an habit and, and then you, you don't feel like, like a, yeah exactly it becomes the the norm and it's not something that you feel uh, like an additional work okay because it is often perceived just as a burden, while it is not, because on the other side, the advantage is you can be recognized publicly for your work and uh, through reuses and reusers, uh, you can not only um, um, somehow be seen for your work, but also learn from them and through their feedback to, to do better. So, yeah this could be the way to make this work better. I add my technical aspects and here is it. Yeah, technical problems. Adapting correctly, yes. The license, the content, it can be sometimes also a source of trouble, but technical aspects, remix constraints, yes, because when uh, the licenses uh, do not agree with one another, 
can be a problem, we'll talk about it. So thank you for your responses and also for your patience with me. I will again start present and go on, I hope. Yes. So in the research article of Wolfgang Admiral, uh, the greatest challenge for educators in relationship to open educational resources was suitability of resources and quality of resources. And also they complained they don't have enough time to search or the resources weren't up to date uh, or they weren't relevant enough for the students or also that the educators don't have enough time to experiment with the resources, which can be also true. So using, adapting and commenting is a way to move forward and also to overcome these uh, constraints. Let's go to the next topic, benefits of reusing and adapting open educational resources. Here are again uh, opinions of educators why are they using what is their motivation to reuse OERs? So they want to learn the topics from the other educators, broaden their resources to have a wider portfolio for the students, broaden methods to use something new for the students not to be bored or stay up to date because the field is developing to get new ideas and to engage students because new things are more engaging for the students and also these active uh, open pedagogy approaches are more engaging for students than a classical uh, frontal teaching. It is also uh, positive for professional development of educators and they use it to prepare better courses. So, the main benefits of reusing and adapting open educational resources may be efficiency, they save energy and time of authors, uh, they uh, don't have to uh, discover the wheel uh, again and again, they can use what the other authors made and focus on the things that aren't covered yet in open educational resources. Also, the resource is accessible immediately so students can work with it as it is. It increases equity, students can access, uh, access materials regardless their social status or disability. It increases engagement because the material is innovative and uh, open pedagogy motivates students to take active part in the process, uh, to comment or help co-create the resources. Also, there is an uh, aspect of development, possibility to improve and increase relevance of resources in the new circumstances as a society is also developing. So open educational resources should be developing too. They're very flexible, which is a big positive. Uh, educators are able to update quickly when something changes or has to be corrected. And uh, also they can be adapted to various groups of students with special needs. So it's not only a question of um, interesting resources or various resources, but for the students with special needs, it can be a question of uh, whether they can learn or cannot. So the flexibility is really important. Also uh, cooperation, possibility to contact authors of uh, the resources we are reusing, give them credit. Uh, maybe uh, mostly when the license is Creative Commons attribution, you have to attribute them. You don't have to contact them or or, uh, or they don't have to agree with your use, but it's a kind of courtesy when you use some complex educational resource to notify authors and it can be good for you both uh, to be in contact, maybe share experiences, or uh, you can give them some new ideas uh, to improve the resource so you can work together. Also, reusing and adapting 
open educational resources uh, helps to display benefits of open science and open education. So how we adapt open educational resources? Again, the main point is to find them and uh, to check whether the license is permissive uh, to revise, so to change. Uh, we have to stress that CCBIND, Creative Commons Attribution Non-Derivative License, does not allow any changes, so we can use the source as it is, but cannot uh, make our versions. Then, if uh, the license is permissive, so perhaps CCBI, we can make changes, update, translate, correct, uh, add something, or refine the resource, simplify it for different target groups, or develop uh, the ideas, attribute it, and integrate into our teaching and use it. Uh, here's the example of a scheme from Foster Open Science. What is open science? And I modify it to my needs. Uh, I edit here the connection to civil society because I think it's really important in, in Slovakia civil society is under attack, so we have to stress it. Another example of adapting open educational resource you know really well, it's NOL toolkit. We translated it into Slovak and uh, in comparison to this previous resource, it has many advantages because this was uh, just a picture. I have to recreate it again because uh, it wasn't in modifiable format, but this NOL toolkit is in modifiable format. Uh, you can easily work with it. And also it has uh, instructions to attribution, what to write, to have the attribution right. So while you are teaching your community about open educational resources, you are also learning yourself how to attribute correctly. Uh, I didn't only translate the resource, but uh, edit a bit. In Slovak leaflet version, we edit examples of repositories because our community is not really aware where to find open educational resources. So to the part for the students, we edit these repositories. And uh, to the part of teachers, we edit examples of textbooks and guides where can they find more information on open educational resources. When we have to modify more complex open educational resource, we have to ask more questions and uh, walk more steps. The first point always is to find it and then check the license. Uh, again, non-derivative forbids adaptation. And also if there is third party content, for example, some illustrations, which are used with permissions. Uh, this is uh, important to know and ask for permission or use another material. We have to plan our work on more com complex resources. Uh, how do you or we want to modify the resource uh, from the perspective of content and technical point of view? Uh, how will we cooperate uh, with our team? We have to agree on objectives, responsibilities, uh, what is the role? of uh, which member of the team and conditions, including also legal and financial, because uh, mostly in our conditions, we translate and adopt uh, for free, but graphics uh, or technical stuff um, wants their fee. So when we want to modify, for example, textbook, and uh, we need to plan the resources for, for some other steps, not only those uh, done by our team. Another important step is format. It should be open, or we have to ask authors for open format. We have to maintain clarity of the resource and respect original authors. 
so we can don't have to notify them but uh, authors are mostly happy when they see somebody in the other country for example is using their materials and they can also put it in their evaluation uh, another aspect of the respect to the authors is to describe modifications we have done and um, describe it uh, correctly. When we modify the complex open educational resource, we have uh, to mind the accessibility and openness and also local relevance. For example, when uh, there is a cited um, law from another country, we have to check our law or we have to check our condition in our countries or conditions of uh, the target group. And in the end, we have to put an open license to our work, license uh, uh, which should be in agreement with the original license or at least uh, not in conflict. Here we have open licenses, Creative Commons. The basic and most recommended is CCBI attribution because it's permissive, it's universal, and uh, you can combine the resources, uh, resources with this license very easily. So if you don't have a serious reasons why to use something, another, use CCBI attribution license. Another option is non-commercial, so the work cannot be used for commercial purposes. Uh, the less permissive is no derivatives, uh, so this license is against revising and remixing. So in, in some cases people use it, but uh, in the world of open educational resources it's not recommended. And also we can encounter share-alike license. So if uh, we are afraid that um, our work may be closed or used um, with uh, used differently than we would like, uh, we can put share alike license to be sure uh, people will work with our resource and revise it uh, would put this license on their derivative work. Creative Commons licenses have three layers and the lawyer readable legal code, so the complicated text, the human uh, readable deed, so the text uh, normal people can understand, and the machine readable code for the search engine. So it is important to add this uh, for uh, the searching portal to find our work. Also, when we are choosing the right license, we have to consider that in the future, we may be able to loosen the license of our work from uh, more strict to more loose, but it's not possible to tighten it back. So from uh, the loose license, you cannot go back. What is open once remains open or maybe opened uh, a step more. Uh, here's the tool, Creative Commons License Chooser, which can help you if you are not sure. And uh, you can see all the forms, uh, the simple text, and also mm, the notifications. So uh, different types. This is CCDI share alike license. You give credit, you allow users to distribute, remix, adapt, build upon the material, even for commercial purposes, because it's not non-commercial. And if others remix, adapt, build upon the material, they must license modified material under identical terms. It may be a problem when you combine this kind of source with CCDI, but it's the decision of the author. Here is one example of such license. 
uh, we modified, translated uh, Open Educational Resource, Passport for Open Science. It's a simple guide for doctoral students uh, defining open science and its aspects. So in uh, countries like Slovakia, the most frequent way to adapt open educational resource is translation because in the whole world, especially English speaking, but also French speaking world, uh, there are a lot of fine resources which uh, we can translate into our uh, less developed community, which is not used to these open ideas. So it's a quick way to transfer knowledge to our academic community and with it trust increasing bonus and origin from the material from prestigious Western institution. If we would say it, uh, they would not believe us as much as if uh, the prestigious French institution says the same thing. So we translated Passport for Open Science as Cestak Otvorenej Vede and used the CCB SA license. So our book is also licensed CCBISA, share alike. Uh, one more slide for the translations, uh, because sometimes we encounter the opinion that uh, why do we translate everything? Every scientific faculty or student of science should understand English very well. Why do you translate? We think that uh, new topics in any field of science and educational materials need to be translated uh, to support learning efficiency, because if you learn new idea in your mother tongue, it's easier, you understand it better. Also to ensure social so social societal impact. We need to discuss scientific topics with the public and we need terminology in our language because when we don't discuss science with the public, uh, disinformation will do it for us. We have a lot of experience with that in Slovakia, sadly. So to maintain terminology, to ensure societal impact, we have to speak on science in national languages. And that's the reason why we translate everything. There is also Helsinki Initiative on Multilingualism, which uh, in uh, previous years uh, stated that it's important to remain multilingual also in science. Um, not only for the reasons I mentioned, but also uh, to have a living infrastructure uh, with national languages uh, to publish science, to ensure this uh, societal dialogue on, on science with uh, different groups, which may not be so proficient in English. So back to the licenses, uh, to adapt, uh, we can uh, uh, use this chart. So if we want to publish adapted work under a different license, we must be careful. Some of the possibilities are allowed, these green ones. Some are technically possible, but not recommended. And these gray are forbidden. So if we want um, to publish CCBI as the adapter. So we have uh, most of the possibilities free. When we have uh, the original non derivatives, so none of these possibilities is free. When it's non commercial share alike, there is just one possibility to go again with non commercial share alike. And also, share alike has only one viable possibility. This CCBI is more universal, universal public domain, uh, has all the, uh, all the possibilities green, but um, it's not used uh, in the context of open educational resources, at least not frequently and not uh, on the complex resources. Maybe some picture, maybe some logo, but uh, not the bigger ones. 
and what if we want to remix the possibility to combine materials with different licenses so we can use this big chart if you want to combine materials it's possible but with certain amount of caution again this non-derivative uh, don't allow us anything and uh, these more permissive licenses have more possibilities what we can remix if you want to know more about creative common licenses they have creative common course and you can uh, get a certificate we translated uh, materials from this course into slovak so we uh, give to our scientists and researchers possibility to learn on this topic there is also a guide uh, for uh, humanities and social sciences we offer knowledge to our academic community but as we see we have to do more because uh, the accessibility of the resource is uh, not the same thing as uh, using of this resource and again we turn to you with a question what is your experience with adapting open educational resources in which way do you adapt then look at the answer garden and you can tell what changes did you make or what changes do you want to do in your selected open educational resource yes so the most frequent is adding local examples or adapting to another groups maybe localizing the resource or changing the target so thank you for your responses and now we come to the last point creating of the educational resource if we can't adapt or don't want to adapt we have to create our own open educational resource so again we have to think about the knowledge gap about the educational goals and about institutional policies and project requirement some project for example horizon project require everything every output shared openly some institutions has the institutional policies for open educational resources or at least for open science uh, that mention open educational resources in some institutions it's standard to share open educational resources but unfortunately in slovakia we don't have any policies for oers also we would like to create some uh, maybe if someone here can uh, have experience uh, they can speak uh, is here in the workshop some person whose institution has open educational resource policy maybe it's rare but it would be nice to have such policy and we can work on it we can support the idea or suggest suggest this to be created in our institution and here uh, in this part of the slide is a link for open educational resource policy development tool uh, if you don't use it it's uh, very interesting to read it how it can look like such institutional policy for open educational resources so the another question is form technical and personal requirements for creating of the resource if it's simple you can solve solve it by yourself but if it's complex you have uh, to ask team or uh, solve more problems you have to choose structure and content choose license um, if it's possible permissive for use 
for example, CCBI. You have to cooperate. Uh, this can be a problem with uh, standard uh, word packages, but uh, we know there exists a collaborative software, for example, Autora, Overleaf, and many others, where you can edit uh, one document by more people. Uh, some of these softwares has also structure and formatting for open educational resources set. So you can choose from uh, different possibilities of textbooks or uh, monographs. When you create your own open educational resource, you have more freedom, but also face more decisions, responsibility, and sometimes also cost than when you adapt open educational resource. We have to create with accessibility in mind because uh, some people don't have the same possibilities as another to access uh, materials in a web. So there are four principles based on web content accessibility guidelines. Uh, they're based on a wider idea of digital accessibility, which offers alternatives uh, to those who cannot use particular sense OER. Uh, for example, when you have podcast, you can make available text transcription. When you have images, you give alternative texts for the readers. So the four principles are perceiv perceivable by more than one sense, offering these alternatives, operable, usable by different devices and software, so the readers can use it, understandable, easy to read, clear explanations, consistent rules through the text, predictable form and functionality, and robust content should work with all browsers and assisting technologies. This may be a little bit complicated uh, from the technical point of view, but uh, if you manage uh, to do such textbook, it's worth it. There are uh, many guides how to develop open textbooks. Uh, here is the example. Uh, you can learn how to develop open textbook using uh, different platforms like Goru, OER Commons, Pressbook, how to remix open educational resources or set up your own platform or open educational resource repository. Um, in this book, there are also some interesting points uh, to challenges of OER, like uh, tackling protective mindset, uh, which we encounter often in our communities, or how to incentivize innovation. So uh, how to motivate people to share open educational resources in academic environment. Uh, there are also another guides how uh, to make open textbooks with students. We already know that open pedagogy is more than open educational resources, more than outputs. It's about the process, a way to engage students as active learners and co-creators of education process. So if you are interested in creating textbooks, you can look at these resources. And in the end, uh, we have activity and discussions about the best open educational resources you created. Or if you didn't create any yet, what plans do you have? or what knowledge gaps uh, do you want to fill with your new open educational resource. So in this workshop, we identified open educational resources for reuse according to various characteristics, selected open educational resources that best fit our students' learning needs, modified and adapted reused open educational resources as allowed by the open licenses, and acknowledge the authors properly, increase the accessibility and the reusability of our open educational resources, and we have chosen the right licenses for all resources uh, according to the project requirement or institutional 
policy and the context so by reusing revising adapting and creating open educational resources you benefit your students because they have wide spectrum of resources and lower costs and higher success rates in their courses and possibility to engage in the creation and improve their skills you also benefit other educators they can save time and effort reusing your resources and also learn from the best uh, you benefit your institution because you showcase quality and culture of sharing to the academic community and also public you benefit yourself because you increase impact feedback cooperation and legacy and last but not least you have more motivated and active students and you also benefit the wider public including the unexpected recipients and that's the magic of openness you are sometimes surprised who encountered your results and um, perhaps uh, they say it, it was some kind of beneficial for them or they learned something important for them so it's uh, the importance of openness you never know uh, what is it good for so create with reuse and accessibility in mind approach for the best although we know that it's not always possible to fulfill all conditions begin with the simple and then go on so in this point i would like to thank you for joining and uh, also thank you for your final message because uh, i totally agree with uh, the approach that uh, as far as we are open to share something that other people can adapt to other people's needs, including their own. We are uh, serving at best the larger community and it would be great to know who is reusing our resources. It and I would be very grateful for anyone sharing with us their feedback because uh, you can always learn from uh, reusers feedback, but it's uh, anyway uh, a good approach because uh, uh, if more people were open to share their resources and their educational resources openly, we would uh, benefit from them as a community globally. So thank you for this final message. And uh, thank you for uh, uh, joining us and being so uh, courageous to, to start with us with your first uh, workshop. Uh, there is another slide if you want to continue sharing your screen with uh, the next uh, workshops that oh. we have in the row. Uh, the first one is about sharing OER and is going to be on the 15th of uh, April. Thank you. And uh, there uh, is another one upcoming on the 6th of May. And uh, I will share the, the registration links uh, to both of them very soon. And I'm ha very happy if you want to uh, continue learning with us. And most of all, if you want to discuss with us, it doesn't matter if you don't want to open your microphone while we are live. It's good even if you want to reach out to us and to our facilitators, including Susanna, after the workshop, because uh, the important part of this is that we continue to discuss about open education. So thank you for being with us, and thank you for your time, and thanks again, Susanna, for your contribution. Thank you, Paula. And to everybody, have a nice day. Yeah, everyone, have a nice day. We will share the recordings and the resources very, very soon after uh, the end of this workshop. Bye, everyone. Mm -hmm.